A reading from the gospel according to John. Jesus said, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living father sent me and I live because of the father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Here ends the reading. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you have a favorite bumper sticker? My Bishop Chilton in Maine had a favorite bumper sticker. And that read, there is no secular world. There is no secular world. A few years ago, my husband John and our younger son Hugh and I, uh, we were living in Florida, but we were out here on vacation in California. And we drove from Sacramento down to Vista, where my mom lives. That's about 500 miles, as you probably know. But we decided not to do the drive in one day because we wanted to split it up so that we could drive through Kings Canyon and Sequoia National Forest in the Sierra Nevada mountains, which we had never seen. Now, I'm sure some of you have been to these parks, maybe all of you have been there, where most of the giant sequoia trees in the world live. As you may know, sequoias are different from redwoods. Redwoods grow primarily on the coast of California, primarily on the northern coast. I'd, I had seen the redwoods years ago, far up in Northern California when I was a child. Redwoods are the tallest trees, you may remember, and they continue to grow taller and taller throughout their long, long lives. But sequoias are the largest trees. They grow only in a swath of elevation from about 5,000 feet to about 7,000 feet in elevation along the sides of the Sierra Nevada mountains. The sequoias also grow very tall like redwoods, but at a certain point they stop growing up and they continue growing out. Sequoias continue to grow larger and larger and wider and wider with each passing year. They are the largest living things on our planet. 
while I was at a ranger station there, I read that sometime in the 1800s, before those areas had been designated as national forests, before the trees were protected, a man had one of the largest trees cut down for lumber. But after the tree was dead and on the ground, he counted the growth rings and he realized what they had just done. They had just killed one of the oldest living things on the planet. That tree was living when Christ walked on the earth. In fact, that tree had been living for a thousand years when Christ was born. That tree that then lay on the ground, dead, was about 3,200 years old. When he realized what they had done, that man stopped logging and he became outspoken in his protection of these giant trees, these treasures of our creation. So that day I was driving our rental car on the winding mountain roads through a portion of both of those parks. When we entered Kings Canyon at the bottom of the elevation, the temperature was about, was in the 90s and climbing. It was in the morning. Forecast to be over 100 degrees as it often is here. But as we climbed into the mountains, you'll know if you've ever done that, the temperature dropped into the 90s, 80s, 70s, and finally into the 60s. It was a different world. We stopped and walked around a little bit at the places where the largest trees grew so that we could walk among them for a short time. I would love to go back and spend a week there or a month. And of course, I took lots of pictures, which I always do but I found that it was impossible to get a whole tree into one photo. They were simply too large. And when I asked my husband to take a picture of me with the trees in the background, he just said, you are going to look very small. I just laughed. Because one of the reasons to go to these places of incredible natural beauty in God's creation is to remember that we are very small. In the scheme of God's creation, each one of us is a very important, but a very small part. And sometimes we humans forget that we are part of an interconnected web of creation. As a culture, we usually treat the world around us and the creatures in it as if it had no value except in terms of dollars and cents. We treat God's creation as if it were something to be used and disposed of instead of something to be cared for and cherished. We try to define what is sacred and secular, what is in and what is out, instead of realizing that everything that God has created is sacred. It is all sacred. There is no secular world. The Gospel of John tells us that the word became flesh and lived among us. And that Greek word for lived literally means tented, as in camped out or pitched a tent. I love that image. Christ, who was in the beginning with God, became flesh and pitched his tent with us. He threw in his lot with us. And as he did so, he showed us the importance of creation, the importance of the incarnation, the sacredness of all creation. He showed us that matter matters. 
he showed us that we too are holy. And so in today's gospel, many of his followers are scandalized by his teaching, and many of them begin to fall away. They simply cannot take, they cannot accept what he is trying to teach them. How can Jesus be both human and divine? How can he share his body and blood with them? How can Jesus ascend to heaven? What is it about the incarnation and the ascension that is so scandalous? Well, I think at least a big part of it is that those who left Jesus just couldn't understand or accept that he became human so that we could become divine. Does that sound scandalous? In the fourth century, Athanasius wrote the incarnation of the word. And in that he writes, he became what we are that we might become what he is. And he goes on to say, we are saved because in Christ, God himself became a human being and died a human death. God became a human to make humans divine. The immortal became mortal to raise mortals to immortality. No mere creature could achieve this but only the very word of God. And the great council of Nicaea, which hammered out the Nicene Creed, decided that Athanasius had it right. This is orthodox theology. It may sound scandalous or um, new or unbelievable, but this is orthodox theology. God became a human to make humans divine. So there is no secular world. That's an artificial division. God became human to make us divine. All of creation is infused with the spirit and therefore it is worthy of our care. We must not use and discard any part of God's creation as if it did not matter. Matter matters. We matter. God created all that is and called it good. We are called, therefore, to a greater responsibility for all life on this planet. From the smallest creature to the largest sequoia, all is sacred and all is worthy of our care. He became what we are, that we might become what he is. Some may find this too difficult a teaching, but I pray that we all may respond like Peter, who said, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to know and believe that you are the Holy One of God. Amen.